Welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, where we celebrate the craft of poetry. Each week, we feature interviews with incredible poets and artists, including Olivia Gatwood and A.E. Stallings, and original poetry read by the authors. I'm your host, James Moorhead, poet laureate of Dublin, California, and author of Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray. Born in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, and raised in the village, Tina Kane serves as the Poet Laureate of Rhode Island, where she is the Founder Director of Writers in the Schools, Rhode Island. In her capacity as Poet Laureate, Kane has established her state's first Youth Poetry Ambassador Program in partnership with Rhode Island Center for the Book, and has brought the Poetry in Motion Program from the New York City Transit System to Rhode Island's statewide buses. Kane is the author of The Fifth Thought, Dear Elena, Letters for Elena Ferrante, Poems with Art by Esther Saunders, Once More with Feeling, and Body of Work. Her debut novel in verse for young adults, Alma Press's play, Penguin Random House, was released in September 2021, and her new poetry collection, Year of the Murder Hornet, that we're going to talk about today, came out with Valise Books in May 2022. Kane is also the editor of the forthcoming Poetry is Bred, the Anthology, which will be published in early 2023 with Nerala Press. Her poems and translations have appeared in numerous publications. Tina, welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. In this collection, which I enjoyed, I read it multiple times. I loved it so much. Uh, It had such a distinct voice. You were very effective in tackling current events and tragedy in ways that are timeless and subtle and without requiring an overload of context that burdens down the poem. A beautiful example is in Rice, where you write, Tamir, meaning he who walks tall, ancient purveyor of dates, sweet fruit of palm. Tamir, the rustle of his winter coat against his labored breath. Tamir. Uh, Such a beautiful example of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, What is your approach to conveying a message while at the same time creating timeless poetry. Well, thanks for, um, for choosing that excerpt. I don't know if I have a conscious approach. Um, I think that my concern is that I address the things that are pressing to me emotionally, socially, politically, philosophically, existentially. Um, and I write from that. And my understanding for poetry that endures for me and poetry that I return to has an immediacy, but it's an immediacy that doesn't expire. So I feel like, you know, what I'm hoping to achieve in poems is capturing the immediacy of my thinking, but understanding that the nature of that thinking is universal and never ends. You know, this collection had a lot of, it's in an original incarnation, it was called Dog Whistle. Hmm. And um, it had a lot of poems that incorporated political speech that I took from transcripts, um, from the impeachment hearings, from CIA briefings, all sorts of um, kind of official documents. And then I was using that speech in personal context. And to me, that's a really interesting project as a person and as a poet, because I think that the political and the personal are really deeply fused. And I think that we see that, especially in this in this particular climate that we're living in, in the United States, the previous administration and the divisiveness in the country. And that speaks to human nature and, and obviously the particulars of this time. But what I did realize as time went on is that those, those particular poems in Dog Whistle started to fall away Mm -hmm. because they didn't have that in like they they, they became stale as time went on because they moved farther away from the particular political detail or moment that I was referencing. And some of those poems stayed, for example, Treatise on My Mouth stayed. And that's a poem where I borrowed phrases from Fiona Hill's testimony at the impeachment hearings because I thought that the message was a bit broader. And then I took that for Fiona Hill dedication, I put it in the back of the book instead of with the title of the poem, because I thought it situated 
it too much in a, in a particular political circumstance. So, so I don't know that I always achieve that, but that is what I'm striving for. And it's interesting that you would remark that because Dog Whistle then became not the title of the book because right. that phenomenon had, it hasn't receded because we're living it, but um, it became less important. And then as we moved into the pandemic, um, I started realizing that, you know, I, the nature of time became a much more um, pressing concern, sort of poetically and personally and politically, um, for the globe. And so the title poem, Year of the Murder Hornet, once I wrote that, I, I thought, I thought, okay, that sense of a framework of time, like a year, but also the weird fleetingness of a thing like murder hornets, which for like, you know, five days was all the rage on YouTube. My kids were telling me about it. And then, you know, we never heard of them again. Yeah. Um, I wanted that juxtaposition. And so then that became kind of the operating framework of how I selected the poems. Yeah, I'd say that uh, I asked this, I've asked this question of a couple poets, A.E. Stallings was another, where she wrote a really beautiful piece about the tragic situation of migrants uh, coming into Greece and how and the iconic photo of the child that faced down in the yeah. sand and then she was really she sees it every day in her daily life she was really moved by it but she also recognized that she's in a position of privilege like I am and how do you write about it and she found a way to do it by relating it to her own children yeah. which made it more timeless which made it more personal but still tied to this really horrific thing that's bigger than any one individual. So I just think you do that very effectively. And it's really like, I think reading poetry, you plant seeds in your mind. I, I do want to try to tackle more issues. I've done it a few times and you've given me some ways to think about how to do that. So I really appreciate that. So I mentioned that Year of the Murder Hornet has a distinct voice. Many of the uh, poems employ tight, short phrases that stand on their own and flow together. You've incorporated white space between the phrases, intentionally stretching the rhythm of the poem. An example from Essay on Movement. The way she and her friends hurried to empty their lockers into borrowed paper bags before rushing to the bus. Their arms loaded up with books. How she was the only one who didn't seem sad or cry. She said all she felt was freedom, and she didn't know why. And I think from that, people will... It's timeless, and they'll immediately guess the context just from that snippet. Um, how has your style evolved as you've grown as a poet, and what influences contributed to creating this form of poetry? Well, I think that, you know, I think that from my book, Once More with Feeling, Body of Work, and now Year of the Murder Hornet, there has been a deeper engagement with, I guess, with politics, I mean, I'm a kind of a political junkie. Um, my dad was a cab driver, but he you know, did his college degree in political science. And so politics was always um, the main discussion <laughs> in our house. And so I, I think about those issues all the time. And I think that Once More With Feeling was a really emotional book in many ways. And, you know, kind of, um, a love letter to a past New York and a, a eulogy for my father. And then Body of Work moved more into my thoughts and my kind of digesting uh, the concept of motherhood, of being a poet, the larger world, and even mythology. And now Year of the Murder Hornet, you know, I think that um, one of the things that happened when I became Poet Laureate, I was called from by the governor's office the day before the 2016 election. And I was really elated. It was I was nervous and it was this wonderful gift, but also terrifying. And then the next day was the election and Trump was elected president. And it was such a crushing blow to me as a citizen. And I think that I had a real crisis in terms of being a poet and now a kind of a public service poet, because I really approached my post as Poet Laureate like a public service uh, project. And I thought, okay, well, you know, look, this is an emergency on a national level. Like, what am I gonna go around reading my poems? You know, <laughs> this seems fruitless and useless. And I thought, oh, what use is this? Mm -hmm. And then after about a week of kind of like literally crying and driving around my car, I thought, okay, well, this is what I've got. This is what I do. 
So I think that shift, so I, I you know, I, I created some initiatives, public initiatives as poet laureate, but I think in my poetry, what happened was I really made more space for political engagement within myself and my personal perspectives and my ways of thinking as a poet. And, you know, that's why I started kind of feeling like political speech needed a place in my poetry, but that I would use it in my own ways. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that evolution happened, you know, over time. And then with the use of white space, I've always really been interested in white space. I, I didn't, I never did an MFA, but I did a master's in French literature at uh, University of Paris. And you know, I studied Mallarmé and he, and I'm about to kind of give a talk on this. I'm trying to figure out how to talk about it, but he um, had a very groundbreaking poem called Un coup de Day, like a roll of the dice in which he really experimented with space. And this was very early on in the 19th century. So um, I've always been interested in French, it's called Les Blancs, which is white spaces, but I've always been interested in the, the spacing and the interplay in poems. And I don't use punctuation very often in my own poems. I like to use space and caesura as punctuation. And even sometimes within the same poem, the caesura is doing something different Mm -hmm. in one line than it is from the other line. Sometimes it's sonic, sometimes it's creating or isolating a unit of meaning or an image unit with a phrase. Um, And then I I just really like to write long lines. So I always write landscape on the page so that I don't feel um, encumbered. And I think particularly like with a poem, like um, what we talk about when we talk about paths at the center of Year of the Murder Hornet, those long lines, I feel like I'm trying to go with momentum. And so, um, so the white space is sometimes grammatical, punctuational, or um, have to do with the movement of the words or the images. Well, I love a tiny detail you snuck in there that you write landscape. I have not heard a poet mention that. And I think that's just an example of, I would think of another way, if you're, if you're stuck writing one way, change yeah. physically how you're writing and yeah. you may see things differently. I love that little detail. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And you, you talked a little bit about how you, well, you didn't do an MFA, you did study French at the master's level. And I learned a little bit of French growing up and going to school for half my life in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to say I learned to be fluent in French. That is not the case, but I did get some appreciation um, and have occasionally snuck in a bit of French into my poetry as a result. A poet, mm-hmm. poem about Normandy. I had a a character in that um, French tour guide that I uh, used some snuck in some French. Um, you know, how is fluency in another language and your experience studying abroad in another language provided another poetic tool? And how do you use that tool without it potentially um, getting in the way of the poetry? That's an interesting question. You know, I I think that you know, Fr- French is, is renowned for its musicality. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, and for its beauty, and it, you know, it sounds musical and beautiful and um, symphonic, but it was actually studying French and f- really studying French literature that made me truly appreciate the English language because um, English vocabulary is much more vast than French Mm -hmm. and it's a much more flexible language, especially in the way that it's taught. I mean, I don't know actually the way that English is taught, but French literature and French writing, the way that they're taught, there's a lot of propriety and there's a lot of um, unspoken rules, like certain verbs that you use with certain nouns. And if you just, if you don't, if you use that verb with a different type of noun, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sit right it's an affront and, <laughs> and English. And, and so therefore writers, unless they're wildly experimental writer and they want to fracture the language, I feel that it creates a little bit of um, a barrier to, to the language being truly elastic and English is really free of a lot of that. But that being said, I think that I really like internal rhyme. And I think that that comes from French because oftentimes French is rhyming even when it doesn't mean to because of the way the past participle has an excellent thing at the, the end. And, you know, a whole third of the language has 
um, you know, the, the way that the verbs are set up, there's three different types of verbs and their past participles are all the same, but they're musical. And right. so you end up rhyming without even meaning to. And because I'm not a, a, a poet who writes verse and rhyme, rhyme first, I, I think that I tend to really um, love the internal rhyme and, 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 and slant rhyme and kind of weave that in there, probably because of the French. It's Be pleasing to me. Beautiful. Yeah, and I've talked to other another poet who studies Italian and is fluent in Italian first and also is fluent in English and has written poems in both languages. And yes, the little jealousy thing about Italian, uh, like... Uh, it's so beautiful. They're beautiful <laughs> and the rhyming is so much easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think English is a challenge to rhyme, but so cool when you get it right. So uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, so the, the pandemic was and still is a cathartic trigger for many writers and creators. The stress, isolation, additional time available for creating. That's why my first uh, my first book was uh, yeah. a creation of the pandemic. Uh, because we're homebound and we're not scurrying around in many other effects. Uh, pandemic themes are woven into You're the Murder Hornet, as it was in the, the, the snippet I read just a few minutes ago. In Designated New Yorker, one of several examples you write, for molecules that might kill me in the subway of my mind or from across the six foot divide at the checkout line. How did the pandemic change your writing routine? Not, not the topics you're writing about, but your actual routine of writing. That's a great question. So it was interesting. I have three kids and they were all home, you know, uh, during the pandemic and they were all in three different school districts, three different schools. And so their experiences, um, digital distance learning were really different. Mm -hmm. um, but the kind of the foundation of the day was that we were all in the house. And um, I, yeah, I used to, I used to work at a table by the hot bar at the local supermarket <laughs> and write there with headphones on because it wasn't a particularly exciting place. And I knew that if I saw people I know, they would just be checking out and be a quick wave. Whereas in a coffee shop, people sit down and say hi. Um, so I kind of, but I, I also felt that I, in the past, I felt that I couldn't write at home because I was surrounded by so many other things like laundry and bills and, and caretaking that I, I, I couldn't, I would distract myself. So the pandemic planted me right in the house with all my kids upstairs. Um, alternately needing things and so forth. So it was a really different, I had to figure out psychologically how to be in my house and not be distracted. That was, um, that was tough. But at the end of it, I realized like, oh, I can be at home and, and, and not go do the other million things that need doing if I'm going to sit down and write um, because my kids are back to school and, um, and I'm continuing to write at home during the day. But one of the things that I did do early on, very early in the pandemic, it was that March that everything shut down in April, that April was National Poetry Month and everything got canceled and we were all kind of it's still in shock. Like, wait, is school gonna open again? What's gonna happen? And uh, so National Poetry Month got canceled. So I started this distance reading series called Poetry is Bread on Facebook and Instagram as a way to celebrate National Poetry Month since we couldn't do anything. And um, and then I just kept it going beyond April because I put out a request and I was just inundated with uh, video readings that people sent me. So every morning for the first 80 to 90 days of the pandemic, um, when we were sheltering in, really still in shock, I would make coffee, get my youngest settled with his virtual learning, and then post the poetry as bread reading. And that was very helpful psychologically because it made me feel like I was still doing something concrete around poetry. And I did one every day and I was sharing other people's work and so sort of feeling connected to someone and then enjoying the fact that other people were enjoying it. And so I, it helped me to feel a little bit less disconnected from community and, um, and it gave me something concrete to do even if for the rest of the day I couldn't really focus or find any time to write. Yeah, and I found that uh, yeah for me as well the uh, it was not the I didn't have the long one hour each way commute to work 
yeah. uh, really t- sapping a lot of my time and, and at, you know, could be soul crushing at a certain point. Yeah, and absolutely. so I had all this extra time freed up. My, my daughters are both university age and beyond. So I didn't have the, the incredible challenge of families with young kids, remote learning. Um, so yeah, I found it, it actually, I had the opposite thing where I had all this time freed up and, uh, and I thought I've got to make, take advantage of it. Yeah. And then you wrote a book. (laughs) Then I wrote a book. Yes. And a book resulted from it. Uh, And I suspect there was a lot of things that came, a lot of creative bursts that came out of the pandemic, um, that we're seeing now. Uh, so New York city is, uh, but you've mentioned a couple times and your father cab driver, by the way, Sean Singer's book today in the taxi. And I interviewed Sean on an earlier episode of the podcast. Uh, that's a wonderful book. I, if you haven't read I, it, he's a good friend. He's a good friend of mine. And, um, uh, I've, I've known about that book. I read the manuscript a couple of years ago and he actually was, he was acquainted with some of these poems as they were being written and was really helpful as a friend in helping me to order the collection and figure out, um, you know, how it should unfold. But he's brilliant. I love that book. And actually the way that he and I became friends is we both had poems in, oh, I forget what the review was. Um, It'll come to me, but we both had poems published in a review. And I saw in his bio, I really liked his poem. It was one of the Today in the Taxi poems. I saw in his bio that he was a cab driver. So I messaged him, I said, hey, my dad was a cab driver, but he always wanted to be a writer and he was always kind of stalling out and failing at writing and not really doing it. So I feel like this affinity for you and your work, because like you're probably the writer my dad wished he had ended up being, you know, and um, and then we um, started becoming friends and we we've had a, co- a written correspondence for, for years now. But actually, I was just taking a walk in the woods before this um, this meeting with you and I was thinking I have to write Sean a letter again because we haven't written in weeks but we've been messaging but we really do like the written letter with the stamp and getting it in the mail and so forth but he's brilliant he's a brilliant poet yeah it was so cool to talk to him and I loved his book I was one of those yeah. couldn't put it okay. down read in one sitting yeah. just start I, to I just couldn't put it down so about New York City, it's such a vibrant, diverse, culturally rich place to visit. One of my favorite cities in the world to explore. So many distinct communities, and I'm glad to hear it's starting to come back. Uh, the pandemic was really difficult on large cities, San Francisco, near where I am included. Uh, you've written about growing up in Hell's Kitchen. An earlier poem, Sirens, is a powerful example. Um, how has growing up in New York and your connection to the city continued to influence your poetry? Well, you know, um, I grew up in Hell's Kitchen, then I moved down to the West Village when I was three. And then we kind of bopped around between the West Village and the East Village um, for my whole life. I moved a lot as a kid. Um, But, you know, those were different times. You know, it was a very dangerous, dirty city in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, where I was living for a good portion of that was, you know, pretty dangerous and not so great. But we were also what they nice, nicely call now free range kids, which was like, you know, you just left your house when you woke up and like, you know, you came back after dark or whatever, um, you know, when you were 10 or 11 years old. Um, so I'm, I'm on a, a really basic level. I'm molecularly a New Yorker, <laughs> you know, um, and I'm half Chinese and I'm half a bunch of other things. But when people ask me what I am, yeah, probably up until really recently because I've lived in Rhode Island now for 15 years. But I always say, oh, I'm from New York. And they'd be like, oh, no, I mean, where are you really from? That kind of thing when you're mm. not Asian. I'd be like, no, I'm really from New York. Oh, I'm half Chinese and half a bunch of other things. But it, you know, it, it pretty much, I, I think I have this in one of the poems in here. I think it's designated New Yorker. I call it the third leg of my proverbial stool. Like, you know, parenting was different back then and my family was pretty fractured. And then, you know, when I was living with my dad as a teenager, he worked nights. So I was just out (laughs) doing whatever I was doing. And I do feel that New York raised me up almost like a parent. Like I learned just as much from the streets as I did from anybody, any grown up ever telling me anything. So my connection is molecular and deep and, um, you know, I, I mourn some of the changes that have happened. It's just, a, you know, like every major city, actually, it's become less of a place where artists can make a life and more of a place that's inhabited by uh, 
um, corporate chains or um, box stores. But, you know, all things being relative, the rest of the country is that way too. So, you know, these are global capitalist forces that, you know, maybe we'll reckon with them and figure out how to contend with that. But I'm pretty much still a New Yorker in my head. <laughs> On a molecular level, my dad, who grew up in New York but lives in Canada yeah. now, retired there, is he will always be a New Yorker. Yeah. It gets into yeah. your skin and stays there. Yeah. At a molecular level, I love that. So midway through Year of the Murder Hornets, you include a striking, distinct piece, what we talk about when we talk about paths, a narrative in captions. I read this long poem several times and once out loud. It's so many things, stream of consciousness, a string of associations, a narrative in time lapse. Uh, in one sequence you write, I heart New York, some sneakers, youngest son, back at it, lunchbox, the terrible mall or path to consumption. How did this poem evolve from the earliest spark of an idea through the revision and editing process to the point where you decided you were done? And I'm particularly interested in the last point because I've written several long poems and knowing when to stop can be really tricky. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is it didn't start as a poem. I, I like to take photographs. Um, I mean, I don't consider myself a photographer or anything, but I like to take photographs. And um, on Instagram, I was taking photographs um, and I, I was kind of playing with the notion of paths, um, life paths, physical paths, and then thinking about mental pathways. And so I, I was taking photographs and making captions. And because I'm a poet, I think about the caption and its relationship to the image and um, punctuation, how that would work and how it works in a really brief format like Instagram. And I'm not a huge social media person, so, but to me, it became almost like a, a collage project and I was doing it every day for a while, a little bit like the poetry is bred. It kind of, um, it kind of got me thinking in, um, a brief deliberate way about my day. And after a while, I started realizing that I was trying to say something. And what part of what I was doing was I was talking to myself about my life. And I was capturing it in brief moments that I thought were emblematic of where I was at. And then one day, I don't know why or when, I, I just decided to transcribe all of the captions. And then I started playing with form. And then, you know, I decided how long each line should be or that it should be stretched out much like a path across the page landscape wise. And, and then I, I, the first incarnation of it was literally a transcription of every single caption. And I wanted it to kind of be pure that way. Like even if it's kind of clunky or it sucks, it's like, this is how it came out. And then through the editing process um, with my editor, we called some of it in order to just bring it, you know, to kind of shape it um, and bring it down to a scale that felt right for the book. But the, the title is a riff on the Raymond Carver story, what we talk about when we talk about love. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that, you know, that notion also connects to the Ann Carson epigraph at the beginning of the book, which says something to the effect of um, sometimes the conversations we're having, like sometimes what we're talking about is not what we're talking about. And that connects to the prior incarnation of the book um, in which the title was Dog Whistle, which is like a dog whistle is like when you're saying something, but that's not what you're really saying is right underneath what you're saying. Yeah. And so, you know, what we talk about when we talk about paths was um, these are the captions, but right beneath the surface of this veneer of Instagram photos and captions is a narrative. And the narrative is about my life. No, I thought that was very effective and unique. I hadn't seen something quite like that before, so I really uh, found it compelling. Got one more question before I hand the mic over to you to read a couple of your poems from the book. I loved in particular and reread multiple times, No Regerts, which was based <laughs> on the subtitle, which reads, was inspired by a misspelled tattoo that was supposed to be No Regrets. So you played with that and uh, an example, an excerpt. For the chocolate milk I drank, the chips I ate for breakfast, every day for a year, in the dark car on the D train, no regrets. 
uh, just the way, I mean, just the language, the phrase, the images, the humor, uh, the, the things I, you know, you can't see unless you have the book, the way you lay it out, the use of parentheses, uh, this strikes me, and I could be wrong, as a poem that may have started with a single strong idea that just screamed out for a poem to be written. I've had that happen a few times, a poem that I wrote uh, inspired by seeing a bell buoy out in the Pacific and thinking what it would be like to be tethered to the ocean. And then that turned into an animated short film. And But it really started with I knew that idea was strong, and then I just had to go figure out how to write it all down. Um you know, so was this was the spark of this poem a single strong idea that evolved, or was it something else? Well, I think that it. Well, well, I, actually, my son has this mug that says "No Regrets," and I had kind of borrowed the mug to make coffee in be, for for a while, and I, I use it at night for tea. But it's larger than the other mugs, and I really want a lot of coffee. So, and we always sort of make a joke like "No Regrets," and because that's um, it's like a, a meme where you know, people get bad tattoos where like they think they're getting the Chinese symbol for peace, but it actually says like no MSG and stuff like that, but they don't know. <laughs> but so or like someone who got you know a, a tattoo that said no regrets, but the tattoo artist wrote no regrets by accident, the spellings and tattoos. So that's what that mug is referencing. And I'm referencing that joke, but I think I was thinking of the nature of regret. Mm-hmm. And there's a moment in the poem where I, I, I allude to um, my mother-in-law and how she had professed to have no regrets. And I was thinking about the notion in general of people not having regrets, paths, what kind of choices people make, whether it's possible to have no regrets and whether regrets are not a bad thing. You know, the the the, the kind of consciousness and the reckoning of one's own choices can never be bad. And, and um, almost to have a regret is to recognize that you were the agent in your own life and that you, it's a form of almost taking responsibility for, for choices as well. So I just became interested in that notion, but then I also became interested in the idea of it as um, almost like a chant, the refrain being a chant. And then it just, kind of went from there. So there's a there's a tongue in cheek aspect to it, but also something that I'm I'm very very to me in some sense is solemn. There's a solemnity there for me at least, and I'm not sure if it comes through in the poem. Now, I think so. humor can be a very effective way to convey something that's deeper. A lot of humor comes from a lot of sadness and anguish. I mean, stand-up comedians, yeah. they make people yeah. laugh, but they are full of all kinds pathos, of trauma yeah. and pathos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So no, I think it was it really stuck in my, I just love that poem. I thought it, yes, it works on multiple levels. And it, it's one of these poems, kind of like Billy Collins, where it has a first read immediacy and then a second and third read uh, deeper meaning. So that's wonderful. So now I want to hand the mic over to you to read a couple of selections from your book. So I'm gonna start with Essay on Beauty or Behold a True Story. And um, in this book, Year of the Murder Hornet, I have several poems that are um, essay poems. Uh, I had been writing essays in my capacity as Poet Laureate for the Providence Journal, and I really enjoy that. So, and I was also reading Lydia Davis's essays, and I really love her. So it seemed to me that Um, I wanted to think through my poems much in the way that an essay tries to build an argument, I guess. So this, but this poem references a, an, an essay that was in the Paris Review by Sabrina Oren Mark, and it was called Fuck the Bread. So that's the reference here. Essay on beauty or behold a true story. There once was a man who claimed he couldn't watch Bonnie and Clyde because Faye Dunaway was too beautiful. It's true, beauty hurts, but it's seldom debilitating. Overrated maybe, the way Meryl Streep is overrated in the eyes of a man who doesn't find her beautiful enough. Fuck the bread, a writer's mother once said when her daughter couldn't find a teaching job or yeast during a pandemic. The bread is over, she told her dismissing life as we knew it. In one fell swoop, bread became language to my mind, no longer elastic in form, 
all leavening lost as bread became love to my heart, a knot of needing and need. Another true story is that I am a mother and a writer who knows about beauty and bread, about language and interruption. I also know the mirror only tells part of the story of a face. The eyes have it, they say, but the eyes can only hold so much. The way a heart can be full and at the same time broken. Different chambers of a single system split. The way Faye Dunaway kills beauty by being the mother of it. How we break bread to partake of it. And, um, and I'll read another essay poem called Essay on Mercy. Essay on Mercy. It's all management before mercy for the suits at the rallies and for those alone in the ICU. Not a single mask to reuse, even for the mothers. Breathing in advance is intense, an anguish akin to combat which it said feels like the second before a car wreck, only all the time. A single prescient moment right before impact that tenses the body for eternity, bruises the psyche and rewrites the system to run solely on adrenaline. But mourning is not war, and Antigone was not her brother. She sought to bury Polynices because ritual is everything so a warrior she became. Still, mythology continues to bewilder as if life doesn't train us for death. It all remains grim if we don't see small mercies in our midst, the lessons we might miss, etc. Once when I was young, kissing a boy I didn't love on a mattress in a floor through off 10th Avenue, I had the feeling I was falling through time. It was then only then, that life wasn't about saving things, at least not mine. Well, thank you so much for reading both those poems. I want to start with Essay on Mercy. I'm really glad you uh, chose this poem. It effectively weaves in multiple themes into a single page of poetry, elements of social commentary, Greek mythology, personal experiences. Uh, share how you crafted this poem, finding a way to connect and balance these disparate themes. Gosh, I, I really don't the call it's so funny how you can make these things and and um it's such a mystery too <laughs> i agree <laughs> with that and i know i ask unaskable questions in some yeah, cases no. well you know i mean i read that essay fuck the bread and i just was so um uh it connected with me it was early on in the pandemic and you know it was when think people were stocking up on all sorts of supplies and there were shortages of things like flour because everyone's thinking we'll never buy bread again we'll have to bake it ourselves you know yeah and, and so and and so there was that that um really concrete detail of the urgency and the panic that we were all experiencing and and, and there is yeah i forget who it's like way back in my life but at some point somebody knew a guy who said he couldn't watch bonnie and clyde because faye dunaway was too beautiful and just couldn't stand it and I thought, well, that's such a weird, like, why can't you get past that? And then I was thinking about the president at the time was Donald Trump and his um, bizarre um, narcissistic fixation with beautiful women and how he had made this disparaging remark about Meryl Streep being overrated at some point in the 80s. <laughs> right, right. And I remember thinking, oh, that just means he doesn't find her attractive enough, right? Because that's, that's, that's a mentality too. And so somehow for me these were all connected in terms of, you know, at the end I say this, this line of, you know, Faye Dunaway kills beauty by being the mother of it, how we break bread to partake of it. There's um, some kind of relationship between um, uh, worshiping and brokenness and the urgency of things not being available and fear and um, kind of, I guess, you know, like the platonic notion of beauty also. But then beauty is truth and the true story, which is, could be the daughter not being able to find flour. And her, and her mother did say like, fuck the bread, the bread is over. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and the bread being the world, you know. Anyway, it's, it's, it's about need and perception. So just one final question about the poems you read. Uh, an essay on beauty or behold, a true story. The closing lines are perfect. I'll read them again. 
the way Faye Dunaway kills beauty by being the mother of it, how we break bread to partake of it. I probably spend more time getting endings to work than any other part of a poem, and poetic endings are so different from ending a piece of prose. They are final words without being final, endings that are also openings. At least that's how I think about it. Uh, the ending of this poem works so well. What is your approach to getting endings to work, to ending the poem without writing past the ending? And I, I just, one more point on that, A.E. Stallings, when I interviewed her, she said, or she said not in my interview, but in a different one, that sometimes she just cuts the last few lines off because the ending yeah. is, she overwrote the ending. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, there's all sorts of strategies because you kind of, it's sort of like, you know, when they say, like, when you're writing a novel, not that I, well, I've written one novel in verse, but, you know, the first, you know, for publishers, the first few sentences have to draw the reader in. For me, the ending of the poem really has to, um, to pull all the threads together so that you leave with, not closure, but with... Um, a sense of um, ability to, I guess, almost like a seam, like closing a seam. Mm -hmm. So that the poem itself is a um, an entity, right? I don't know. Uh, I do like sound. When we talked about French musicality and internal rhyme, I do like the end of a poem to have a kind of a crackle or a, a sound to it that helps to do that closure. I also remember... Uh, reading a biography of Robert Lowell like 30 years ago. And like in that biography, it mentioned something that that he did when he was revising, which was if a poem wasn't working, sometimes he reversed the meaning of the final line. Mm. Like he just flipped the whole thing. So I do that sometimes because it always stuck with me. And it's not always the solution, but what it does do is it wakes you up to the fact that you may be overwriting, the fact that the that what you're doing is trying to state what you would like the poem to tell the reader. And so you stick in at the end as like a kind of a, um, a frantic gesture, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, like this is what I mean. See, and I'm going to put an image in there to show you. Um, and, and then, and I do think that sometimes cutting it out and ending it in a place that maybe is unexpected is helpful, but I don't know. I, I, I you know, I probably go through all of those things and then just land on one that seems to work for that particular poem. Just one final question, in addition to supporting this book and all the things that that entails, uh, what are you working on next? Well, this summer I'm trying to finish, I, I've been asked to write a second young adult novel in verse for this imprint, Make Me a World, so I am I'm finishing that, I'm trying, and that's fun because it's for a younger readership, so it's a really different mindset, um, but I'm also trying to work on poems for a new book, which is tentatively called Search Engine. And there's a poem in Ear of the Murder Hornet called Of All Things, and that poem will actually serve as the first poem of this next book. Oh, very cool. So, yeah, so. Well, on, on the, with regards to young adult novel and verse, I, I just interviewed the other day. I don't know, actually, if her interview will come out before or after yours, so it's either a, a, uh, a preview or, or relating back to something people have heard, but I, I, I did an interview with Safia El Hilo. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she wrote a wonderful young adult targeted novel and verse. And one thing I'll say about young adult books, which I made at the point in the interview with her, is uh, that the constraint of a young adult book, although I think young adults are much more savvy than than they're given credit, but there's still a constraint in terms potentially of length, in terms of complexity, that those constraints can result in some really wonderful books. And I've reread books that I read as a young adult, as an adult, yeah. and went, oh, that's so tight. It's so yeah. economical. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a wonderful forum. So I think it's Young Adult Plus is because yeah. uh, yeah. I think young adult books can be very, very uh, interesting to read as an adult. So it's great to yeah. hear that you're doing another I one. So too. I think so, too. And apparently there is a readership. There's a whole bunch of adults out there who read. They consume YA avidly, which I really didn't know about. Yeah, I just there's a there's a couple series I read um, uh, as a, they're still on my bookshelf where I pick them up and I go, yes, I can tell they're targeted at young adults, but they are so incredibly effective and tight and yeah. economical. So that's great. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed your book, uh, You're the you. Mur Murder Hornets. I encourage everyone to go check it out. And uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. You've introduced new elements to this series of interviews. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. And I, your questions were great. So I, 
I appreciate all that thinking and time you took. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I definitely invest hours uh, yeah. to make the best use of the interviewee's time, which I thoroughly respect. Yeah, it shows. So thanks. The Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast is written and produced by James Moorhead. You can follow me on Twitter at Dublin Ranch, subscribe to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, and follow us on viewlesswings.com or on Instagram at viewlesswings. <laughs>